Hey Danny, what do you want for Christmas? Oh, I'm not really quite sure. Actually, can you buy these 20 board games I have compiled from Board Game Geek Online earlier? Goodbye! Are you looking for that perfect Christmas gift for that very special someone, or are you simply looking for a game to evoke some quality moments across the festive season? Well, in this video, we take a look at some fun board games to fill up those Christmas stockings, to chuck under the Christmas tree, and put a smile on everybody's face. Azul is a Spill de Jars winning abstract strategy pattern building board game where players take the role of tile laying artists as they take turns to draft different coloured tiles to decorate the King's Palace. Based on where players place these tiles, players who connect them together most efficiently to complete certain patterns will yield a large reward from the king in the form of victory points. The player who gains the most victory points will win the game. Azul does not need to be unwrapped, despite the fact that it looks a lot like a Christmas present, in order for players to uncover its simple yet rich gameplay. However, it is the third title in the Azul series that is the game that I'm highly recommending this Christmas to be that shining star on the top of your Christmas tree. Across each round in Azul, players draft by picking sets of tiles from the factory display or central play area. Players will be loading their tiles into different floor lines by filling them up with a single tile pattern. Like a glorified Christmas display, completed floor lines allow players to place their pattern tile onto the mosaic wall row corresponding to their chosen pattern. Players are ultimately aiming to place and score connecting tiles orthogonal and completing horizontal and vertical rows, as well as gaining victory points for placing all of the tiles of particular pattern type on their wall. In Azul's Summer Pavilion, just like in the classic version of Azul, players still draft tiles from a common factory display. However, now there are six different coloured style tiles, with one colour being deemed a wild tile each round. Once players have gathered their tiles, they'll then try to spend those tiles to place them in numbered spaces on their board. The number on the space indicates the number of tiles required to place a single tile in that location. Wild tiles can be used to supplement this cost. Players score points by completing single or multicolored flowers. Victory points can also be scored from round to round when tiles are placed adjacent to previously placed tiles, triggering some awesome victory point combos. When a player encloses one of the three different types of bonus spaces, this allows players to gain extra tiles from the scoreboard. Across the game, players can plan ahead by saving particular tiles for future rounds by placing them on the edge of their board version of Azul is the perfect game for newcomers. It's got a very simple rule set, high level of tension and very heavily weighted decision making opportunities. The idea that players may be drafting for the same type of tile and trying to fill up their row and placing it onto their mosaic is really quite tense. I really like the orthogonal and end game victory point scoring systems because they really well and truly reward players who invest in certain particular strategies throughout the game. Whereas Azul Summer Pavilion really well and truly promotes forward long term planning. The idea that players know what wild tiles are going to come up means that they're going to probably save some of those wild tiles and, you know, giving them a whole lot more flexibility and adaptability in the later rounds to come to try and complete those stars, which players probably know they're not going to be able to complete every single one, but picking the right colour and really trying to finish it is going to be important for yielding those really big victory points at the end of the game. I also love those little bonus spaces and when you enclose those bonus spaces, you also get to draft from the 10 tiles on the scoring board. Players might be thinking, oh, I need a blue one and I need a red one and I know this color is gonna be a wild in the next turn. You might be able to pick those tiles that you want and invest in them later on. Arboretum is a strategy card game where players are creating an arboretum represented by an array of tree cards that are played from their hand. With 10 different species of trees, each numbered from one to eight, players are attempting to score points by connecting different parts of trees in their tableau. The player who is the most efficient at putting up their Christmas tree and scoring the most points will win the game. In Arboretum, players are searching for that perfect tree to place in their Arboretum. Players are essentially going to be drawing two cards on their turn, either from the top of the deck or from an opponent's discard pile. Players will then select one tree card from their hand to place into their Arboretum, which is built both, both vertically and horizontally like in an array. Through developing their Arboretum, players are essentially aiming to create paths that link particular species of trees together from the lowest to the highest numbered card of that particular species. 
play score one point for each tree in the path from lowest to highest. They'll score an extra bonus point if it begins with a one and an extra two points if it ends with an eight. Players will score an extra bonus point per card if they have at least four or more cards of the same species in a linking path. There is a catch, however. Players can only score a linking tree path in their Arboretum if they currently hold the highest numbered species of that card in the hand compared to the other players. Arboretum is an excellent two-player game despite the fact that it's made for up to four players. It's got a very simple rule set, yet a very intriguing scoring mechanism. The idea that players can only score species in their Arboretum if they hold the highest valued number of that particular species in their hand at the end of the game. And if another player has a one and you're holding an eight, your eight essentially becomes nullified, becomes zero, and the other player who's holding the one gets to score that particular species in their Arboretum, denying your chance to score that particular species. That brings in a huge level of metagaming that can actually occur. Arboretum is also a game about progressively open information, which means that as the game progresses, you're gonna find out more and more about the certain types of cards that players are playing and what sort of cards still remain in the Arboretum deck. This really is a huge element because you're almost able to deduce what sort of cards people might be vying for and might be keeping in their hand. So using that information is powerful knowledge that will help you to devise your own strategy for trying to outwit the other players. Like the lyrics of your favorite Christmas carol, word games are a highly accessible game genre that are more likely to pique the interest of unseasoned gamers alike. Much like the ever popular word game series Codenames, Letter Jam and the Spill de Jars award winning game Just One are games that are more likely to break the ice and detract you from those very awkward family conversations at Christmas time. In Just One, one player is given a single word to guess, kind of like celebrity heads. The other players try and help the guessing player by providing them with a one word clue which they write on their whiteboard easel. The clue should link semantically to the answer. The catch here in this game is that if two or more players have the exact same one word clue, they are cancelled out, effectively making the guesser's job so much more difficult. In Letter Jam, each player begins with a jumbled up five letter word created by another player. Across each round, Players will only be able to see the other player's letters, but not their own. To guess their own letter, players create words using only the letters that they can see. Thus, this provides the other players with the information that they need. After players guess all five of their own letters, they attempt to create a five letter word, which is an anagram of their original word. If it makes any sense, they win. If all you want for Christmas is one board game, then just one is your contender. It's like celebrity heads, but with single words. And I really think that this game definitely shines at the high play counts. It's got high involvement, the rounds are fast, uh, all of the clues are determined by the players, so it's team and group driven. And the level of clues that players provide is just both hilarious, but also creative as well. You want to give a clue that's not too far-fetched to confuse the guessing player, but you don't want to be too specific because other players might have the same word and uh, they might cancel out and therefore you might not get the point for your team. Letter Jam is a much deeper deduction game where players have to fill in the gaps. I mean, if players give a clue like W-A-blank-E-R, is it water or is it wafer? Do you have an F or do you have a T in front of you? By using other players' clues, you're trying to deduce five letters that are sitting right in front of you. And if you're really good with anagrams and letter sequencing and you really enjoy games like Hanabi, this one is definitely right up your alley and is one I've enjoyed time and time again. There is always one person at the Christmas party who really doesn't want to get noticed. And that best sums up the game, Insider. Insider is a brilliant social deduction game which plays out like 20 questions where one player takes on the role of the master who knows a secret word and the other players in the group take on the role of commoners who ask the master yes or no questions in an attempt to guess his or her secret word. The twist is, is that one player takes on the role of the insider who already knows the master's answer and prompts the other players to try and guess it before time runs out. They need to do so in a very subtle and non-obvious manner so that they don't reveal themselves to the group because if the other group suspect that a player is an insider and they guess correctly, the insider loses the game. 
In Insider, one player takes on the role of the master and is given a random word from the word deck. The player who is secretly given the Insider role knows the master's word. However, the master does not know who the Insider is. When the game commences, players take turns asking yes or no questions to the master. It is the Insider's job to help everybody try and guess the master's word without looking too suspicious. Otherwise, the Insider loses the game. Once players guess the word correctly, they vote to see if the guessing player was the insider or not. If not, they vote for another player. If the insider is not identified, the insider wins. Insider is a deceptively fast and intense game, especially if you're given the role of insider, as you need to be deceptively creative about how you give clues and prompt players to try and get to the solution. Now, when a player does guess a word, everyone's speculating about whether they guessed it because they were the insider or whether they were led unsuspectingly to the answer by a prompt that was given by the insider earlier on. And it's all about crafting really cool and fun answers to ultimately guess this secret word that the master knows. Now, it's best played by having everybody ask a question by going around the circle so that everybody's included in the conversation. And I feel like that is the best way to get the best out of this game because it means you get to hear everybody's contributions and that kind of quick turn-taking element means that everybody is involved in some way. Tiny Epic Quest is a sandbox-style adventure game for fans of The Legend of Zelda as players control a band of three meeple heroes as they embark to save the world. Players will take actions to maneuver and position their meeples in order to try and complete quests, fight goblins and learn powerful spells. Through acquiring important artifacts, players are able to upgrade their meeple stats. The player who slays the most goblins, completes the most quests, earns the most victory points and thus wins the game. Tiny Epic Quest requires players to move their heroes across a map using five different forms of movement. Players will attempt to fulfill movement and treasure quests to gain extra bonuses or abilities. These are achieved via positioning meeples on a map in a particular orientation or completing certain temples. Players throughout the game can acquire or upgrade their weapons or equipment as well as learn new spells at obelisks which can help them to advance up the magic track which improves their player's ability to fend off goblin attack. Through a combination of defeating goblins, upgrading your legendary items, completing quests and upgrading your magic spell levels, players will earn the most victory points and hopefully be able to win the game. The theme of Tiny Epic Quest really evokes that sense of nostalgia of all those Christmas holidays where I played Nintendo with games like The Legend of Zelda, The Ocarina of Time. It's got this very interesting pusher luck dice mechanism where you roll dice to try and conjure magic and advance up temple spaces and gain power and see whether you are attacked by goblins. The map configurations in the game each time you play vary in terms of the way you set them out, which makes the game incredibly replayable. The idea that when players complete quests throughout the game, they might gain some item meeples, little items to stick on your meeples, which give your um, heroes certain extra abilities to help um, improve their efficiency of completing some of those quests. Also, I love the temple upgrading system where players who complete certain temples can also upgrade their legendary items, making their uh, band of heroes so much more powerful throughout the game. Time to put the star on the Christmas tree. King Domino is a Spiel de Jars award-winning board game where players are drafting domino tiles and placing them in their kingdom to try and connect similar terrain types together with a crown in them to maximise and score some big victory points. The issue here is that each player's kingdom has limited space and connecting similar terrain types can be proven to be a very tricky task. In King Domino, players aim to build a kingdom no larger than a 5x5 grid in size. They draft domino tiles by claiming them using king pools. Players attempt to connect together terrain of the same type by making them as large as possible. Only terrains that feature a crown in it actually score, and the more crowns in a single connected terrain, the more the region is scored through multiplication. King Domino is an excellent Santa-sized stocking filler that has this really beautiful, excellent, puzzly game element to it. I really love the fast gameplay, the simple rule set, and it's very family friendly and easy to delve in. It's got this really simple and cool scoring mechanism where the more crowns you have in a particular connecting region it multiplies your points by a certain factor which really means that you really want to get more crowns in a particular area and make that area super large. I also like that towards the end of the game as your kingdom fills up 
you need to optimize the tiles that you choose and kind of plan out where they're best going to be positioned so that you have more options towards the end of the game. Amongst all the bright lights at Christmas, Splendor is a game that truly shines at any social gathering. It is a gritty game of chip collecting, card development and simple economic engine building. Throughout the game, players will be collecting gems and acquiring development cards which will provide bonuses for allowing them to purchase more expensive cards and ultimately attract the attention of a noble. The player who earns the most victory points will win the game. In Splendor, players gather gems which they use to purchase development cards from different pre-graded levels. Playing a development card allows future purchases for a player to become cheaper and thus creating an economic efficiency engine. If a player has the right number of combination of gems in their tableau, they are visited by a noble, yielding them extra victory points. Players continue purchasing cards and building their tableau until one player surpasses 15 victory points which triggers the final scoring. I really love Splendor because it's all about generating really cool gem combos and using them to acquire high T cards. I really love the poker style feel uh, weight to a lot of the gem chips and it really has this great immense satisfaction when you're cashing them in and acquiring a card into your tableau. It's also about drafting cards and taking cards that you think other players need and nabbing them before another player does or reserving them means that you can disrupt another player's economic engine that they're trying to build. This game is all about pure efficiency and making calculated moves and thinking ahead about what you want to acquire and how you're going to get it and how you're going to use it to enhance the speed of your engine so that you can get to the 15 victory point mark first and surpass the other players. Alright, I think that's a wrap. Christmas is a beautiful time to spend with family, friends and loved ones and board games are a really great way to bring people together. I hope my suggested list of Christmas gifts for this festive season is going to serve you well and hopefully bring you a lot of fun times and a lot of joy into your lives. I want to say a huge thank you to all the people who currently subscribe to this channel. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. If you really like this video, please remember to like, subscribe and share this video with all your family and friends. I really am well and truly appreciate it. This is Danny signing out. See you again next time. Goodbye.